Good morning. Um, welcome to the um, webinar this morning on, um, on NICE's um, priority research areas. Um, my name's Nick Crabb and I'm the Programme Director for Scientific Affairs at NICE. Um, so just to quickly go through the running order, um, we're going to have um, some, some sort of brief presentations on NICE's methods research priorities, and these will be delivered by my colleagues um, Kunal Shah and Dalia Dawood. And um, they're both sort of senior colleagues in the um, science policy and research team at NICE. This will then be followed by a 15 minute presentation from one of our collaborators, Carlos Diaz, who's the, the, the chief executive officer of um, Synapse Research Management Partners. And we've been collaborating with Carlos on a number of sort of EU related projects. That will be followed by another um, short presentation from Professor Alan Weilu from the University of Sheffield. Um, and he'll be talking about support in NICE and sort of methods research areas. And then finally, there's going to be a Q&A session where um, questions from the audience um, will be addressed. Um, and we're also going to have a poll at the end just to sort of um, gauge sort of interest in, in sort of future topics and um, instructions will be given um, for, 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 for that poll. Um, now, in terms of um, participating, um, any questions can be asked in the, the Q&A section, and we're going to monitor that section throughout the webinar um, and um, do our best to, to sort of answer anything, anything raised. Um, the session is going to be um, recorded and it's going to be made available on NICE's YouTube channel, um, and um, we, we expect that it'll be, the recording will be available by um, early next week. Um, now, if you wish to um, ask a question in the Q&A box, but you want to remain anonymous, um, the, the way to do this is, is to not um, provide your full name. So, so if, if anybody wants to ask a question anonymously, um, that um, facility is available for you. So um, I think that's probably all I need um, to say by, by sort of way of introduction. Um, but it's um, a great pleasure to, to hand over to, to my two colleagues and um, to talk about NICE's methods and um, research priorities. So um, the first presentation will be from Kunal Shah. Um, Kunal is our Associate Director um, in Science Research, uh, Science Policy and Research Programme. And Kunal's main focus is, is in our science policy work activities. And um, he'll then be handing over to Dalia Daoud who's our senior scientific advisor, also in the science policy and research um, program team. And um, Dahlia leads on a portfolio of, of um, research, uh, grant funded research projects, mainly um, funded through the IMI and Horizon 2020 um, sort of research projects. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over at this point to Kunal. Thank you very much, Nick, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, so as Nick mentioned, Dahlia and I are going to be taking you through some of NICE's methods research activities. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and, and the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna begin by referring to NICE's five-year strategy, which was published last year. Um, and what this shows is that all of our methods activities um, ultimately contribute to the Institute's core purpose, which is to improve health and well-being by putting science and evidence at the heart of health and care decision-making. Now, our methods work relate to all of the four pillars underpinning the strategy, but I think in particular to um, pillar four, leadership in data, research and science. And what, what the point here is that in addition to conducting evaluations and developing guidance, we also engage in research to promote improvements in methods, in data and in science. Next slide, please. So here are our stated ambitions in relation to Pillar 4. Um, at NICE, we are seeking not only to be users of research, but to really drive the research agenda across health and social care. We would like to um, lead the development of innovative approaches to using and analysing data. And we want to consider how our guidance and advice products have impacts on the environment and or on other non-health outcomes and we want to explore different ways of understanding and using the views of patients and the public. So to deliver our ambitions uh, we're seeking to develop world-leading capabilities and standards for routinely using real-world data to inform all aspects of our work and working with partner organizations to do this uh, and we're looking to drive the future research agenda 
and funding priorities through collaborations with academia, with government and with industry and addressing those issues of most relevance to NICE's methods and to patient care. And we also want to uh, explore the potential to including environmental impact data in our guidance to help reduce the carbon footprint of health and care. Uh, next slide, please. So here are our priority areas. There's 10 in total, uh, and information on these can be found on the research part of the NICE website. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, you know, we, we are happy to be approached about other areas, but these are ones that we have identified as areas that we are particularly interested in from a methods point of view. And uh, for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about NICE's activities in relation to the first four priority areas, and then I'm going to hand over to Dalia, who will talk about some of the other areas. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll begin uh, on measuring and valuing quality of life. So, you know, one of the main activities in relation to quality of life that NICE is involved in is um, helping to oversee a new study to generate uh, uh, a UK value set for the EQ5D5L instrument. But in addition to that, we've got a range of other quality of life focused activities uh, with, a, with, with a methods angle. Um, so in relation to children and young people, we are seeking to clarify NICE's preferred methods for measuring and valuing health related quality of life in children. So this includes projects uh, that focus on questions around which measures of child health outcomes NICE should be recommending, for example, based on um, evidence of psychometric performance of competing instruments. Uh, it also includes projects around which methods should be used for the valuation of child health states, which in turn covers questions such as those around um, uh, who, whose preferences should be sought um, to form the basis of these valuations and which stated preference techniques are most appropriate for eliciting those stated preferences uh, from, from the appropriate sample. For carers, we are also seeking to update NICE's methods to include some guidance on how to incorporate health effects for carers with the view to uh, a potential modular update um, to the health technology evaluation methods manuals in the future. And for well-being, NICE has contributed uh, from the very start of a uh, multi-year project uh, to develop a new measure that seeks to um, capture elements of well-being as well as those traditionally included in, in health-related quality of life. This is the, the EQHWB or health and well-being measure. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, um, I've just provided some examples of projects and publications of relevance to the policy of life area. So on the left-hand side, um, we've got the logo of the Quokka Research Programme. This is an Australian-based um, research programme seeking to answer a range of research questions around how best to measure and value health-related quality of life in children. NICE is contributing both as associate investigators to this programme, but we're also participants in the programme's decision-maker panel. So although the projects themselves, of which there are six in total, are focused on Australian data, many of the research questions that they're addressing are, have parallels to the research questions that NICE is interested in answering uh, in England. So there's a couple of um, relevant publications on the right hand side. One is a uh, just published paper in Value and Health, providing an overview of the development of the EQ HWB measure. That work was led by colleagues at University of Sheffield, but it's got a large international co-authorship, including um, three current or former members of, of NICE staff who've been working on the project from the, from the very beginning. And then at the bottom, uh, there's a paper that was recently published in the journal Children, uh, authored by current and former colleagues in the science policy and research team, uh, which looks at some of the challenges around measurement and valuing quality of life, specifically in very young children. Next slide, please. So the next um, methods area is views of the public. Um, so our advisory committees have to make moral, ethical and social value judgments as well as scientific ones. And the views of the public inform the types of judgments uh, that our committees make and provide the basis of NICE's principles. And indeed, meaningful public engagement uh, has long been uh, one of the core principles at the heart of NICE. 
We recently launched uh, Nice Listens, our new program of deliberative public engagement, which has been developed to give us an understanding of informed public opinion on these types of issues. Um, so we, 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 this will help us to ensure that our policies on complex and controversial issues reflect the values of informed members of the public. We just completed our first Nice Listens project on health inequalities, and we're in the early stages of planning our second project, which is going to be focused on environmental sustainability. In addition to Nice Listens, uh, which is an, one where we um, collaborate with external partners who help us deliver the dialogues, uh, we're keen to collaborate with external researchers studying our guidance on social values uh, and how these are interpreted by our committees. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned the, 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 the next Nice Listen project on environmental sustainability. We've also got a, a range of uh, other work on environmental sustainability. Um, we, we acknowledge that NICE's guidance affects the way that healthcare is delivered, which in turn has an impact on the environment. And we're exploring ways to incorporate information on environmental impact into our guidance and advice products so as to re help reduce the carbon footprint of health and care. Uh, to do so, we've been engaging with academic partners to help us scope a framework for quantifying and presenting environmental sustainability information uh, in a consistent manner. Importantly, we want to ensure that our work on environmental sustainability complements other relevant work being undertaken across the health and care landscape. Next slide, please. So the final research area I'm going to talk about is patient preferences. Um, we a couple of years ago we uh, participated in a project funded by Myeloma UK to understand how data on pref patient preferences can be collected and used. And then following that project, um, some of my nice colleagues published an article in the Patient Journal, which summarises Nice's perspective on the role of these kinds of studies in HTA decision making. So, in the context of Nice's methods, we don't currently see a role for quantitative patient preference data to be directly incorporated into health economic modeling, but we do see a potential role for these kinds of studies uh, and evidence to be submitted alongside other types of evidence. We don't currently have any live projects regarding patient preference research, but we're very happy to support investigators who are seeking to undertake research to improve the quality and usefulness of this kind of evidence. So thank you very much for listening. I'll now pass it over to Dahlia, who will take you through some of our other priority areas. Thank you so much, Kunal. So if you move to the next slide, please. There. Yeah, so the next um, area is the data science and analytics. And uh, this has been an area that has uh, received a lot of attention over the last few years within the HTA community, but also uh, within clinical guideline development and evidence-informed decision in general. And our aim from focusing on this area really is to further our knowledge of using big data and real world data, including how to analyze and inter interpret these types of data and use them to inform uh, our guidance uh, in, uh, in combination with uh, other types of evidence that we have naturally or normally used before, like RCT evidence specifically. And we have, a, we have a number of projects that are primarily funded by the European Commission in this area as public-private partnerships that have been ongoing for quite a while since the start of the Innovative Medicines Initiative, or IMI, and also uh, continued in, under IMI2 and now um, Innovative Health Initiative, or IHI. Uh, and these include the GetReal initi Get and the GetReal um, Initiative, Harmony projects, the Harmony and Harmony Plus Alliance, which focus on hematological cancers, and uh, most recently, Eden, uh, that looks at uh, developing a federated data network across uh, Europe of data sources, but also at uh, developing or generating evidence to inform uh, decision making. So this area has been a very active one, uh, as I said, and uh, on the next slide, we can see a number of presentations of uh, publications that we have produced from our work across the years on different projects. Uh, some of them have completed, as I said already, like uh, I'm Impact HTA, uh, and also the Eden uh, project has a number of publications in this area. Uh, and we continue to focus on this area and we expect it to be a major one for our activities uh, in the next year or so. So uh, on the next slide, we can move to the next 
uh, research area or research priority area, which is digital health. And as you can imagine, this is an area that has been receiving a lot of attention and specifically after the current pandemic also and the uh, expanded use of re remote monitoring and digital apps. So we are interested in developing methods for the assessment of digital health technologies. And our Office of Digital Health is collaborating with an academic consortium of Imperial College, University of Birmingham, and the Alan Turing Institute to update our evidence standards uh, framework. But we are also within our uh, funded research projects, we are working on topics related to digital health and also the use of digital uh, endpoints, for example, uh, in, in, in trials and generating evidence using uh, or data collection using wearables, for example, uh, under one of our project, Neuronet, we are looking at the use of digital endpoints uh, in neurodegenerative uh, disease uh, disorders research. Um, so th this is, a, again, an area of, of great interest uh, for us. And on the next slide, um, we can see that uh, the, the following focus area or the next priority area is precision uh, medicine. Again, this is a, an area of growing interest within HT in general, but also looking at how to individualize treatment specifically and how optimal outcomes can be achieved by tailoring treatments received uh, to individual level needs. And this is primarily using prediction models at, at, the, mo uh, at, uh, at the moment. So we have a number of projects that are looking at the use of AI-based and machine learning um, uh, methods that, to develop these types of prediction models. And these are explored uh, as part of two of our projects, uh, Eden and uh, HTX or health technology, uh, um, uh, Next Generation Health Technology Assessment. Uh, and these projects focus specifically on how can we develop uh, reliable prediction models uh, in order to uh, predict, uh, for example, the efficacy of treatment for specific individuals with specific individual characteristics. We've also done work on uh, histology independent uh, indications, and these are types of um, indications where that are not uh, focusing on a uh, specific um, tumor site, uh, but you're looking at uh, markers. So this is how to evaluate oncology drugs, for example, that are licensed based on a biomarker rather than a tumor location. And we have published uh, a method, method paper and analysis paper on, on this topic as well in the PMJ. So the next priority area then is uh, the use of antimicrobials uh, and the development of antimicrobials as and also combating antimicrobial resistance. And the work in this area is uh, hinging on three really uh, focus areas. So how we can support the development and encourage the development of new antimicrobials, how we can um, tackle antimicrobial resistance. And uh, most recently, we have also become very interested in how our, in our response to COVID and, and how we can be prepared. So pandemic response and pandemic preparedness topics are very important for us. Uh, at the moment. And on the next slide, a little bit more uh, details on, on these uh, areas. So uh, on the area of developing antimicrobials, we, we conducted a um, major, major program of activity on the, on the evaluation and payment models of new antimicrobials in collaboration with NHS England and NHS Improvement. Um, and we completed two pilot uh, evaluations uh, in, this, in this program. Um, and the, the primary aim is really to understand how we can encourage the development of, of antimicrobials, giving the, the small market uh, or target market for these, uh, for these drugs. We also are partners in a major uh, collaborative uh, project, uh, again, European funded, the IMI era for TB project, which looks at the development or accelerating the development of new treatment regimens for tuberculosis. And in the area of tackling antimicrobial resistance or, or looking at uh, possible solutions to, to combat antimicrobial resistance, we are partners in IMI Value DX project, which looks at the value of point of care diagnostics to guide and ensure the appropriate uh, prescribing of antimicrobials for respiratory tract infections. And finally, in terms of the COVID-19, we had a, a, a huge number of activities under the HTX, the Next Generation Health Technology Assessment Project, which is a Horizon 2020 funded project, where we focused on trying to understand the challenges that are facing HTA agencies and developing best practice guidance for the assessment of COVID treatments and uh, diagnostics. But also there was a, a huge uh, activity within the Eden project from our partners looking at how we can generate evidence that could help with 
regulatory as well as HTA decision making in response to uh, to the to the pandemic. And on the next slide, uh, uh, I have included a number of publications. Again, if you are interested in looking at these that uh, that have emanated from this work, particularly on assessing or looking at the challenges of of assessing technologies for uh, COVID nineteen and how we can the HTA agencies should be approaching it and a best practice guidance to doing that. So in, on the next slide, then we move to the next research priority area, which is innovative access busway. And, and this is an area where close working and alignment with regulators, payers, and other HTA agencies at the heart of. So we are trying to ensure foster access to health technologies by, uh, by aligning our work with regulatory uh, with, with the regulatory um, work as well. So development of the innovative licensing and accessing, uh, an access pathway or ILAP with the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency or MHRA in the UK and also other HTA agencies within the UK, the Scottish Medicines Consortium and All Wales Therapeutics and Toxicology Centre have been at the heart of uh, or has been at the heart of this uh, specific research priority uh, area. But we have also played leading roles in previous uh, adaptive uh, busways initiatives from, for example, the ADAPT SMART, the MIT New DIGS programme and the European Medicines Agency Adaptive Pathways pilots um, over the years. And finally, uh, last but not least of our research priority areas on uh, the next slide, it's uh, transforming NICE and the implementation of NICE guidance. So I'm really interested in looking at ways of um, uh, uh, improving or transforming how we do um, our work and how we produce our guidance. A nice transformation is an ambitious and uh, organization-wide change program that has been established to deliver uh, our five-year strategy um, 2021 to 2026. Uh, and uh, a, a big part of it is the move towards using living guidelines and how we can, for example, look at using artificial intelligence and machine learning to facilitate the identification of evidence and the timely update of our guidance recommendations. So there will be a lot more activity in this area of using living guidelines uh, as we move on. Uh, but also we are very keen on supporting the implementation of our guidance because it's not really useful unless it's implemented in the healthcare system. So we are interested in establishing which implementation strategies are most effective in uh, delivering the outcomes or improving patient outcomes as this guidance is intended uh, to do. So these are, uh, uh, as Kunal said, these are our top 10 research priority areas. Uh, but as you can see, um, uh, it's it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, these are the, the key priority areas that we think we will be focusing on, uh, at least during the, the current strategy uh, period. But we are open for uh, contacts from you. And on the next slide, you can, um, uh, we are keen on collaborating and, and uh, in research with uh, academics, with other partners who are uh, interested in, in these, Mr. Uh, who has joint interest in this these methodological priority uh, areas and I have put uh, on the slide uh, the areas of our website where you can get more information uh, and then we encourage you to get in touch with our team the science policy and research team um, to and, and as I say by partnering with us you can get unique insight into the real um, life uh, practicalities of assessing health and social care interventions but I, I'm sure we are biased and so I, I really invite you to hear more from our speakers today on their experience from collaborating with us. And thank you very much. Um, and that's it from me, Nick, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Dahlia and, and Kunal. Um, just a reminder to participants um, that we, we, we do have the Q&A function for, for any questions that you may, may have, and we'll be going through those later. So um, please um, keep your questions um, coming if you, if, if you have any. Um, it, it, it's, it's now my great pleasure um, to, 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 to hand over to um, Carlos Diaz, who's the, the founder and chief executive officer of Synapse Research Management Partners. Now, um, Synapse um, specialises in management of complex research and development projects in the health sector, um, really specialising in projects that are highly innovative, large, distributed and internationally orientated. And um, Carlos and colleagues have broad experience in initiatives supported by the European Commission and the um, Innovative Medicines Initiative in particular. Um, another really major area that um, Carlos is, has taken on recently is um, leading Synapse's project management services to the Darwin EU project. Now, this is a major data analysis and real world interrogation network um, that's been initiated by the European Medicines Agency. 
Now today, Carlos is going to be talking to us about experience of collaborating with NICE on European grant funded research projects. So Carlos, over to you. Thank you, Nick. Thanks um, everyone at NICE for in inviting me. Uh, so yes, I mean, a little bit of an unbiased uh, external perspective on collaborating with, with NICE. So if we move on to the next slide, let me um, step back uh, for a minute and reflect a little bit on the importance of collaboration. I think that um, we, we all know that this, but, but sometimes you know, it's good to reflect on, on the state of science, um, including medicine um, at large. And I think that the, the structure um, of the scientific system is still uh, lacking in a number of aspects. And I think you know, there's uh, some consensus around this, uh, still very based on um, what I call heroic individualism. But there's also uh, the first competition uh, between academic organizations, between companies, um, you know, between sectors even. Uh, a lot of fragmentation resulting from that, a lot of overlapping efforts, and we're, we're seeing that. And at least from an external perspective, there's also a lot of fragmentation in terms of the regulatory landscape, um, affecting HCAs, uh, payers, et cetera. Um, still science being delivered pretty much based on, a, on, on projects, which have a, a start and a finish, a very, very strict timelines, uh, and therefore challenges in terms of how to sustain efforts in specific areas. Uh, I think still relying a lot on a very marginal cumulative knowledge evidence generation. Um, and of course, there's this classical problem such as publication bias, for example, um, institutional inertia, uh, excess bureaucracy uh, on a number of levels, uh, a multitude of funding agencies. Sometimes you have to hire consultants just to find out uh, where can I apply for funding? You know, it's a labyrinth really. Um, changing political priorities, uh, we've seen that recently as well. Uh, and I think a, a more a perhaps postmodern development, which is the extraordinary impact of media as well. Uh, you know, social media, tweet, Twitter, uh, etc. cetera, um, very high impact, very short lived as well. So that is also affecting, I think, the way science is delivered. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I think that these results still in a very medieval uh, kind of a structure where uh, mostly everyone is trying to build their own castle. Some castles are nicer, some are uglier, some um, smaller, some larger, but still they're built for defensive purposes, right? Um, and, and this is perhaps not the best strategy if we want to uh, be able to uh, counter the challenges we're facing at a global scale, really. Um, so it is, I think, uh, pertinent to ask ourselves, you know, is, is the scientific system enabling the best science or not? Uh, and of course, the, the answer to that is, well, you know, I mean, there's uh, collaboration across institutions that happens all the time. So if we move on the, to the next slide, um, a little bit of a personal reflection, I think that, that there's a need for a systems leadership approach to, um, to leadership in science. Um, I think that more and more there's a realization that we need to gather voices from all stakeholders to avoid such fragmentation of efforts. Uh, we need to develop networks of trust. Uh, we need to perhaps focus on, on short-term uh, problems that we can solve um, with, with the specific actions. Uh, there's a need for co-creation as well, uh, a little bit less of a top-down uh, priority-driven uh, 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 research, and perhaps more of a middle-out, if you like, strategy, et cetera. So uh, I think that this has been, uh, uh, there's an increasing awareness that perhaps this uh, approach would be uh, more productive. And if we move on to the next slide, in terms of, of collaboration, I think that yes, I mean, collaboration happens all the time, uh, but there's, there's perhaps a curve of productivity in collaboration. So there's two extremes, perhaps an extreme in where there's too few rules, and this is typical of academic collaboration, if you like. So there's a voluntary collaboration space at the other end, we would see uh, collaboration very highly regulated through no a number of rules uh, that, that let, lead to normally bureaucracy. Uh, and this is a very tightly regulated space. So there's pockets of productivity that can be had at both extremes. But I think the, uh, the sweet spot really is the middle uh, section of uh, we have to move into, uh, into a sweet spot where we can actually uh, leverage the maximum productivity uh, from a collaboration. And I think that that defines probably what, what I call uh, a world changing space. So a couple more clicks will do the trick. Exactly. So that's a sweet spot uh, in the middle. Uh, and I think that that will allow us to actually reach that, that make a difference threshold. 
um, and have the maximum productivity from collaboration. So this is the space we've tried to leverage uh, through signups uh, for, for, I think it's 14 years now since, since the company was founded. And then we, if we move on to the next slide, um, allow me to indulge myself. I think we've, this space has value and we've seen that in the, um, uh, the success of the company of the past decade or so. Um, not just in terms of number of projects, but also in terms of the network of collaborators that we've been able to, to build uh, throughout the years. So if we click uh, and move on to the next slide, this is the project timeline. Uh, so essentially IMI projects, because those are public-private partnerships, perhaps the paradigm of public-private partnership in biomedicine. Um, and we've uh, been, been fortunate to actually be leading a number of, of research projects. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, the ones highlighted here have been uh, through collaboration with NICE. So very clearly, there's been an increasing uh, collaboration with, with NICE. Uh, NICE has become really a key partner for us um, throughout the years, um, but increasingly important as well in its role in the different projects um, uh, in time. So if we move on to the next slide, just in the interest of time, uh, you've seen from Dahlia uh, the uh, summary of the different projects and how NICE has been contributing to the different projects. Now, from an external perspective, what strikes me is the uh, adaptability and the flexibility that NICE has shown. Um, you know, the role of NICE has been varying throughout the, the, the projects. Um, in Roadmap, for example, uh, NICE was instrumental in, in uh, gathering an expert advisory group, which was fundamental to the success of the project. Um, so a number of experts uh, from regulatory and HTA agencies that could actually uh, advise the project on the principles and the use of real evidence for Alzheimer's treatments. Um, Harmony and Harmony Plus, very uh, different role of, of NICE there, representing as well a regulatory perspective. Um, but in Eden, for example, uh, NICE is leading use cases, uh, whole work package uh, that, that looks at how uh, uh, we can enhance regulatory decision making through the generation of real world evidence, what kind of data have to be uh, gathered, how harmonization has to take place, etc. Moving on to the next slide, just a few more examples. Um, HTX has been mentioned already. Actually, in this project, uh, you know, we didn't have to invite NICE. NICE invited us to actually participate in the project. So there was already this kind of two-way dialogue uh, between our institutions. Uh, ida 4 tb has been mentioned as well um, in terms of antimicrobial resistance uh, for tuberculosis. And I think Neuronet has been perhaps a prime example of collaboration because we actually co-designed the project together with NICE and Alzheimer's Europe as patient representative organization. Uh, and I think that this trio of institutions, uh, we have achieved great things with not much funding, to be honest, uh, over the last uh, three years. Uh, and, and NICE's role has been essentially one third of the project um, in terms of uh, very important in terms of impact analysis of the IMI new generation portfolio, which is some 20 projects right now, um, how they have affected the, the new generation field, uh, but also in terms of guidance and decision tools uh, for uh, regulatory HCA and payer engagement, which we identified was one common challenge across all or most of the 20 new generation projects in IMI. So if we move on to the next slide, this is an example of the outputs that NICE has, NICE has uh, generated in the project. Uh, this is a, a decision tool uh, that guides people in their interactions with regulatory agencies, the different procedures, sometimes very difficult to understand from an outside perspective, and how you can engage with the different types of agencies at different levels, at different steps in the, in the research process. Um, I think a very valuable resource that is also publicly available through the Neuronet uh, knowledge base. I think that this is uh, just one of the uh, tens of examples that we could um, put forward, um, exemplifying a little bit the, the nature of the collaboration that we've been having with, with NICE. So just as a summary um, in, on my last uh, slide, I think that collaborating with NICE has been uh, fundamental for us. Uh, NICE has become a prime collaborator uh, to enable uh, HTA perspectives on, as you can see, a very different projects. Um, uh, importantly, NICE has allowed us to actually channel uh, our communications and our interactions 
within the HTA space, breaking silos, um, allowing us to identify which agency would be best positioned, um, what kind of opinion leaders should we consult, uh, etc. And this is, again, from, from an external perspective, this is very daunting. Uh, you know, if you don't have a way to understand the whole environment, it is almost inextricable. So, um, so I think that it, it has been very important, uh, the role of NICE in terms of representing the, uh, the regulatory perspectives, uh, gathering experts in the field, providing unique knowledge. Not a lot of partners can actually uh, have, have this status as an opinion leader in the field. Um, and also, you know, on a more operational level, uh, we, had, we had an excellent collaborative relationship, uh, very easy uh, to communicate with NICE at all levels. Uh, the flexibility to adapt to different roles depending on the needs of the project um, and also a channel to propagate project results in terms of communication it has been a big boost as well uh, for every project that we've been uh, managing over the past few years so that in a nutshell would summarize uh, how the collaboration with NICE has happened uh, for us and for the rest of the partners participating in these different projects so I hand over back to you uh, Nick thank you very much Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, great presentation, and we 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 really do um, value the collaboration. So so many thanks. Um, it's it's now my pleasure to um, <clears throat> hand over to Professor Alan Waylu. And um, so Alan um, is a professor of health economics at the University of Sheffield, um, and he's worked as a health economist at the School of Health and Related Research um, at Sheffield um, for over twenty years. Um, Alan's the director of the decision, the NICE Decision Support Unit um, since 2006. Um, he's very experienced in economic evaluation in many different clinical areas, um, and his research experience includes um, work on a broad range of methods relating to um, economic evaluation and the inputs to such evaluation. So, Alan, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I can't see the slides. I'm just waiting for them to come up. Great. Okay. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about my experience um, or, or experience of projects that have occurred in Sheffield, many of which I've been involved in um, sometimes as a kind of core researcher, other times a bit more peripheral, but I'm going to try and draw together my experiences of working with NICE specifically on methods based research. Um, and, and point out some sort of general general uh, lessons that I think might be drawn and might be useful for other people. Uh, next slide, please. So there are really three sets of projects that I've been involved with over the years, which have had some form of collaboration with NICE. First is, is EPRU. So this is the policy research unit, which has a very long title, but is reduced down to EPRU. It's about economic evaluation. Um, and that's a collaboration between the University of York and Sheffield. The other is the NICE Decision Support Unit. Um, again, this is a based primarily in Sheffield, but we have collaborations with a, a, a quite a large number of other universities. And then there's other research grants. Um, so things like uh, the MRC, what's now called the Better Methods for Better Research program, whole range of other types of funding, particularly fellowships, both from NIHR and MRC. So I'll go through each of these in turn, give you some examples of projects and then bring together some, some sort of uh, lessons from, my, from those experiences. Next slide, please. So EPRU is a currently a five year quite a large program grant, which is commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care, and it, the grant comes via NIHR. We're halfway through that five-year grant, and this is actually the second time that um, the York-Sheffield collaboration has been successful in running EPRU. So we had a previous um, EPRU one that started in, I think, 2011. We have a very varied work programme, we developed that work program in conjunction with DHSC, but also all of the department's arm's length bodies are included in helping to determine what our work program should look like and, and are also included in the initial commissioning of these policy research units. And NICE is included uh, as one of those um, ALBs. And it's probably 
uh, of all of those departments, one of the most active in determining our, our work program. So we have an oversight group. They uh, look at proposed work. They provide suggestions for things we ought to be doing and ultimately determine what our work program should look, should look like. They make the sort of final decisions about prioritization of, of our resources to the to topics of interest. We do a mixture of things. We've got longer term projects which include a number of, of uh, areas which we included when we originally bid for, to run the, the unit and they are continuing. And then we also, do, we, we also undertake shorter term projects, particularly reactive projects, which come to us from DH, but also can come via any of those arm's length bodies. And there have been several projects that NICE have specifically asked for that we've worked on at quite short notice. Uh, so NICE has this, this um, option of routing specific pieces of research that could then be commissioned via EPRI. So just to give some examples of the work that, that we've done, you've already heard uh, Dahlia talk about the antimicrobial resistance work of which there's a couple of examples of things that have been done by EPRI. So the first uh, was around developing a framework for payment mechanisms. This was led by York and was actually um, predominantly in collaboration with NHS England, at least originally. This is about trying to establish um, different ways in which uh, payment for new antimicrobials could be assessed and particularly how, what would be the framework for assessing the value of a new antimicrobial, you know, given all the challenges uh, around how you might use them and particularly this challenge of delinking payment to use when you may want to use a new product uh, either as a, as a backup or in rotation or any other sort of use strategy. So in order to stimulate innovation in those areas, there needed to be some sort of thought about how to, how to use those payment mechanisms and how would you go about assessing value in order to implement any of those payment mechanisms. And then the second part of that was two pilot assessments. So this was looking at existing two existing antimicrobial products and using these as as case studies to implement this this framework which had been developed in stage one so this was closely aligned with nice it was a pilot in that it was really testing out whether nice's normal sort of technology appraisal processes were um could be used in the assessment of these types of products or what changes would be required. So part of the challenge was using the same kind of timelines, the same constraints, including the amount of resources available to undertake those assessments. Uh, we've done other work, we're currently doing other work. So Kunal talked earlier about um, various pr uh, projects involving uh, measuring and valuing health. So there are two projects that we that are ongoing as part of EPRU, looking at aspects of quality of life in children and adolescents for economic evaluation. So one of those looks at um, assessing the content validity of different instruments that could be used uh, in those populations. The second is looking at the question of how to go about valuing uh, health state so who ought to be doing those valuations should it be children adolescents adults experts and if so what perspective ought they be asked to adopt when they're when they're providing those valuations and we've also done a, a range of work about the use of eq5d 5l for for appraisals at nice so looking at what the impact would be of moving from 3l to 5l and also developing a very large um, data set in, in order to allow us to estimate, uh, to undertake the mapping between 3L and 5L or vice versa. Again, pretty important for NICE to be able to um, make that switch in a consistent way. Uh, next slide, please. So the other um, area that I'm involved with is the decision support unit. So this is a this is a, a unit that's actually been around since about 2003, so the very early days of, of NICE and was originally um, commissioned to provide, I guess, a bit of an insurance policy to NICE. So partly it's, um, it exists to provide assistance 
originally just to the technology appraisals program uh, when there are particularly challenging issues that arise in the course of a, of a particular appraisal. So the DSU would be there to help with those sort of uh, extra challenges. Um, but there's increasingly a focus on more sort of applied or on, on methods development to help underpin NICE's methods guide uh, and the development of that guide. So in recent years, we've produced 10 um, reports that have been used to underpin the 2022 methods guide update that was published in, in January. Um, and they cover quite a range of different topics, but the DSU is quite small. Uh, the, the funding isn't uh, anywhere near the amount of EPRU. So we really only undertake fairly small scale um, and fairly rapid projects. So some examples of the things that you may have, may have seen, we produce a series of documents, technical support documents, which are designed to uh, help analysts implement the methods which are described in the methods guide. So these are usually summarizing or signposting research information that exists elsewhere. They don't tend to be new research, though some of them do include uh, new research, development of software. For example, there's been simulation studies and case studies included in the survival analysis methods uh, guides. So we've covered a whole range of topics, and these are fairly highly cited as well. They, we've covered observational data for the estimation of treatment effects, survival analysis. There are two or three looking at different aspects of survival analysis. There's a whole series of um, TSDs that cover aspects of measuring and valuing health and evidence synthesis. And then another area, uh, which is a good example, I think, of collaboration with NICE. So this has been producing estimates of the burden of illness. So this is a project that's actually run. It's not a single project. It's run over several years um, in response to various policy um, initiatives relevant to NICE. So we really started this back in 2015 when there were discussions about value-based pricing, which became value-based assessment. And it's been resurrected recently and uh, has informed the severity weights which appear in the new methods guide. But this was really about uh, using NICE's technology appraisals, reviewing them, looking at trying to estimate what the burden of illness would be and therefore providing information that would allow NICE to develop um, severity weights, test out what the impact of various weights would be uh, on the sort of portfolio of, of previous appraisals. Next slide, please. And then the third area I said was more sort of general research, so the types of funding that would be um, available to all academic departments. So we, we've had success through um, a range of different funders. We've also had failures as well. Um, we've, we've won grants through the MRC, what was called the Methodology Programme, NIHR fellowships we've been particularly successful with, focusing on methods research at all levels of seniority, but particularly pre-doctoral and post-doctoral levels. And all of these projects have involved nice staff or involvement to some degree, and it's been quite variable. So we've had cases where we have simply had a letter of support saying that this is an important topic to NICE, it's a priority area. We've had undertakings that um, there would be help with dissemination of the results at the end of the funded project, but we've also had co-applicants from, from NICE in, involved in some of these projects as well. So quite a range. And some of the examples so there are, there's a fellowship uh, currently being undertaken, a PhD fellowship, looking at care quality of life. Another, there's another topic that appears in the, as a priority in the current methods guide. We completed a three-year MRC methodology program on, ma on mapping methods. Um, again, I mean, that's then been developed in other ways beyond what was in that original um, methodology research, developing, um, other applications, we had, an, we had a nice uh, co-applicant on that, on that research. And there's the project, the Extending the Quality Project. Again, Kunal mentioned this earlier. This is um, started off um, 
as an MRC methodology program, but there's also EPRU work, which looks at um, extending that further by validating some of the outcomes. So the, the methodology program doesn't itself take it to the point of developing a, an instrument that would be ready to use with a value set. Um, okay, next slide, please. So a few reflections on my experience of working with NICE, so that a, a few of the, the really good things. Um, the, the first is, it's worth noting that a lot of these topics, even when you get a standalone grant to develop research, it's very rarely the case that you end at that point and the work ends up um, in use from that point onwards. There's always, there's always more research to do, but there's, there's often important sort of implementation work as well that's required in order to get it to the point where it might be useful to decision makers like NICE. And a good example of this is, you know, one of the first things we did on methods for the DSU was on value of information, looking at, uh, you know, how the actual mechanics of doing the calculations, demonstrating the usefulness of those methods to uh, real um, HTA projects. They were actually nice appraisals used as, as examples. And that was, that was produced, the first report came out in 2005, but the work was done, you know, even earlier than that. So that's still being discussed as part of the most recent um, methods guide update. So, you know, there are lots of examples like that where it never ends. And having NICE involved, I think, actually helps you to focus on getting, getting to a deliverable at the end of it. I think NICE can help with accessing case studies, uh, potentially research data. And this links to the fact that involving NICE staff uh, makes you focus on what the Institute really needs. So where are the recurrent problems? What are the issues that this is going to help? And making sure that the research really does inform um, the methods that are required for NICE and the guidance that it, that it produces. The other thing is that NICE staff tend to be, you know, they have a great knowledge that very few other people have of, uh, of the kind of portfolio of things that NICE looks at. So some other people like committee chairs or um, committee members might have some insight, but it's nice, nice stuff have a pretty unique position to help with um, giving examples. Um, and anyone who's filled in a research application and tried to fill in that um, pathways to impact section knows that that's really hard to fill in. And nice is one of the easiest, clearest routes to impact that, that people working in this field, particularly in the health economics field, can, can uh, provide. Next slide, please. Some of the challenges. Um, so I think, you know, NICE, NICE have a whole range of, of different staff and different ways in which they, they're willing to collaborate. Um, and it's very obvious that there's an advantage to ensuring the relevance of your research and helping to disseminate that and making sure it gets into practice. Uh, and the skill, there are some very skilled technical staff, experts in particular research areas, so that they can make a very uh, important contribution to the research itself, as well as the sort of implementation and dissemination. But that just needs to be very clear from the outset about what the roles what the roles are. I think it's also worth pointing out that some of the when you undertake case studies, anyone that works with NICE on on their guidance producing programs knows the timelines are tight, the challenges are tight, and therefore you know those same things apply when you're doing case studies. So antimicrobial resistance is another example. Um, and more broadly, I think it's also worth pointing out, you know, whilst NICE has its own priorities and its own needs, that, that some of that research is competing for a very small pot of money. And we need to be careful that, you know, other research doesn't get crowded out too much. So, you know, NICE isn't the only customer for research. It isn't the only customer for HTA, even in the UK. So there needs to be a balance where we make sure that Whilst there are these, um, you know, it's, it's always important to put, it's always helpful to your research grant application to be able to put on that this is one of NICE's priorities uh, or that they're involved, but there needs to be space for other types of research, other methods of research that might not be a priority for NICE as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. And, um, and uh, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, we, we, we very much value the collaboration over, over many years. It's much, much appreciated. Um, OK, I think we're now um, moving on to the, the, the sort of Q&A um, 
part of the, 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 the event today. And we do have a number of questions in, and there's probably still um, time for um, a few more if anybody does want to um, ask any, any, any sort of further questions. So um, just to start, um, we have a question on, um, on um, are NICE looking at how patient preferences can be captured and incorporated into NICE process more effectively? And I think that's probably one for my sort of NICE colleagues. So I'm going to start with Kunal for that one. Sure. Um, well, I mean, our updated uh, technology evaluation methods manual retains the recommendation uh, that was in the previous version of the manual to, to use the preferences of the general population as the basis for valuing health related quality of life. But we acknowledge that this misses potentially important information on the preferences of patients, uh, for example, around um, certain health outcomes that they consider to be important or uh, things about the ways in which treatment and care is delivered. Um, so in my slides, I noted the paper by um, my nice colleague, Jacqueline Bouvi and colleagues that was published in The Patient. So I highly recommend reading that um, if you want to understand NICE's position on the role of patient preference studies. So we, we do see a role for patient preference evidence, but just to be submitted alongside other types of evidence. And we are keen to support work to improve the quality of this evidence, because you know from what we've seen, it, it can be mixed and, and subject to bias. Thank you very much, Kunal. Um, anybody want to add anything? Dahlia, did you, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's perfectly clear. And uh, I think Kunal explained our position in terms of that. And as he said, we are really open to, to approaches in terms of uh, further research in this area. Perfect. OK, um, so there's, there's a couple of questions now that, that, that are a bit more um, sort of focused on, on um, NICE's um, sort of modular updates. Um, so um, let's take the first one first. So, so will the health inequalities modular update be consulted on? And when will this happen? And when will it be introduced? And I'm not actually sure that we can we can sort of give definitive answers to that at this stage, but um, but Kunal, I'm gonna start with you again. Sure, and, and actually I'll, I'll see if I can cover both of the, um, the, the general topic of modular update. So we do have a range of topics that are uh, have been identified as candidates for future future modular updates and we have an internal methods and processes group that's seeking to uh, map out priorities among these and identify what further work is needed for each of them so that work could be normative work uh, it could be methodological work or it could just simply be we're waiting um, we, we need more evidence uh, unfortunately, we're not yet in the position to be able to specify timelines for the consultation and implementation of individual modular updates. On health inequalities specifically, what I would say is that we, we have a programme of activities underway to um, strengthen uh, NICE's approach to addressing health inequalities. And the recently completed NICE Listens project on health inequalities that I mentioned earlier has um, all the findings of that basically supported the continuation of those activities. It doesn't suggest that we should be doing something dramatically different um, from plans we already had. Um, I'd probably expect to see movements first in our guidance, guidelines and implementation work. I think when it comes to technology evaluation and potential quality modifiers, there are, there are still quite a, a few important challenges. So understanding how health inequalities interact with other factors that are the focus of quality modifiers, like the, the newly introduced severity modifier. Uh, there's still a lot of questions about how to generate robust and reliable quantitative evidence that the, on the value uh, placed on reducing health inequalities relative to the value on improving health outcomes. And then there's the really important issue of how to account for opportunity cost and the impact on health inequalities of any displacement of activities caused by funding of new technologies and programs. So th there is a research agenda. It's, it's, it, health inequality is very much on that agenda, uh, but at the moment can't specify timelines. Thank you, Kunal. Um, okay, um, there was another, another question, which, which again is sort of based on modular updates, but it's around this time, it's around some of the process issues like expedited pathway, and straight to managed access pathway. Um, I, again, I think the sort of timing um, 
around these is, isn't yet clear. So I'm not sure if any colleagues have got anything more, more, more to add to that. But then, um, you know, these are all things that are being sort of mapped out and worked on, but I don't think we've got to the point of um, having any anything specific to share at this point. Um, is that okay, Kunal and Dahlia, or do you have anything further to add to that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we've got some, this is a really interesting one. This next one's very, very interesting. And I think it's, it's um, this, this will hopefully bring in all, all members of the panel. So this is one to really sort of get the gray cells um, working. So if infinite funding was available, what are the priority barriers needs that need to be tackled for taking improved methods into widespread uptake and implementation? So I'm gonna, Alan, let me start with you. Um. Well, I think some maybe that uh, value of information is a good example there. Uh, so I think the conclusion of the report that we did back in 2005 was uh, these methods are useful, uh, particularly when you've got research uh, research priorities. But it never went anywhere. It never it never made it into nice guidance. Never never made it into nice formal methods because there were challenges around. Um, or concerns around the sort of computational complexity of implementing them. Uh, and that's exactly the same argument that's happened 15 years later in 2022. And again, it's not in the, in the methods guide. Now, there's, there's clearly some relevance of the methods, and there's a, I don't think that there's too much of a debate around that. And I think um, you know, most, most of those issues have actually been, or some of those issues have been resolved the, the computational issues have been resolved. So that's an example, I think, where uh, what, would, what would be required to get those methods into use, I guess it would be not so much about new methods research, it would be about funding, uh, training, development of software, educational materials uh, to relevant parties to allow that kind of thing to, to happen. So I, I, I think that, that would be the key implementation issue. And often that's what's lacking in other methods research. So you get paid a research grant to develop new methods and then you and then it it ends. You might go and present it at a conference and then that's it. You don't get you don't get research funding to go and teach people how to actually implement the methods. And that's that's where ultimately most of these methods development for nice guidance producing programs is required. So I think that that's where the gap is. Um, and that's where I would concentrate funding uh, to get to get implementation uptake yeah. the other bit about uptake i mean there is a bit of a it's not really funding it's about a sort of um getting people together and talking and overcoming suspicions about academics wanting more and more complex methods versus being pragmatic that's probably less about funding and more about other networks yeah. no, th thanks Alan. that's really really helpful reflections and um in, in, in many ways, you know, I think we see the science policy and research program at NICE is very much being about that sort of translation. So um, some very helpful food for thought there. Now, Carlos, you're used to sort of cutting through complexity in your day job. <laughs> so um, in, any any reflections from you? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, proposition may seem unrealistic, but actually it's, it is a very valid point. You know, I mean, if money was no object, you know, what's the problem here? And I think there's lots of problems that are not, not the uh, existence of funding. We sometimes blame the lack of funding for other types of problems, which are um, human nature, if you like. <clears throat> the way <clears throat> you have to um, activate collaboration across stakeholders. Um, I see that every day. I mean, uh, the, the uh, syndrome of saying, look, you know, we are companies, we behave differently, you are academics. Um, you're supposed to do ABC. Uh, these guys are regulators. So there's there's like um, stereotypes that's still very much present in any collaboration, and that hamper uh, such collaboration. And I think Alan's point on the uh, gap or the valley of death, if you like, between a research project being finalized and having very promising results, and then their uh, application in real life. Uh, how do you actually translate that into something actionable? is very valid. I think that there is a huge problem uh, in terms of continuity of assets or, or sustainability of assets. And everyone is talking about it, but, but very few people are actually trying to come up with practical solutions on how to overcome that. So again, you know, once more fragmentation, collaboration, uh, you know, 
cross-stakeholder uh, spaces, I think, are needed more than ever. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to another couple of questions. I, I'm going to have to apologise to attendees that we're not going to be able to cover all of the questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of choose some of them based, based probably more on the sort of experience of the panel and ability to answer them. Um, and um, my next one, I'm going to start off with, um, with, 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 with Dahlia. And then um, Dahlia, sort of going forward, how will NICE analyze real world studies as ev evidence in technology evaluation? And what, be, what will be some key priorities in evaluating a real world study? Any reflections there, starting with you, Dahlia? I'm sure, I, I'd say watch this space because NICE will be soon uh, releasing the RWE framework for consultation. Uh, it has already gone to the board and it will include guidance on how we will consider real world evidence in our uh, in our um, guidance product and um, some uh, uh, criteria that we will consider in terms of data suitability, uh, as well as what are the preferred analysis methods. So they will soon be uh, more uh, out in, in public about uh, about this. At the moment, we are considering this definitely as a as a key area, uh, as I mentioned in our uh, RWE focus the project so within the Eden uh, project there is a lot of work that's ongoing about that and trying to develop methods but also identify a best practice and uh, in terms of data quality and data interoperability harmonization uh, building networks so there is a lot of work from Eden uh, specifically that that will be definitely uptaken by, for example, the EMA uh, through its Darwin, the link with Dar through Darwin. So um, hopefully this will also kind of inform uh, our future guidance in terms of the use of RWE. And our involvement in Eden is specifically focused on uh, understanding how these methods can be translated in terms of HTA use case, in, in terms of HTA and, and specifically. But for NICE specifically, I'd say wait for the RWE framework coming out soon. Thank you very much, um, Dahlia. I'm going to move on to another question, just in the interest of time. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so, so there's, there's one on sort of environmental um, work. So, 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 and I'm going to ask Kunal to start with this one. So, um, please, can you update us with further details on the environmental sustainability projects? There are particularly, th these are particularly needed as a high priority due to the NHS target to reach net zero in the next few years. So, any brief reflections, um, Kunal? Yeah, completely agree that this is an important priority for the health and care system. Uh, and we're sp speaking regularly to our colleagues in the Greener NHS programme to make sure that our work um, complements theirs. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a strategic commitment to considering how to incorporate environmental impact information in, in our work. In terms of specific projects, um, we're working with um, the York, York Health Economics Consortium to help scope a framework for quantifying and presenting environmental sustainability information in a consistent way. Uh, we then will have to have a think about, you know, how we would then further develop that framework and, and, and potentially use it because we understand that, um, uh, you know, as, as much as this is a, a key priority for the NHS, which we are there to support, it's also uh, a substantial departure from the types of outcomes that NICE normally involved in. And then NICE Listens um, will be another important project here. So this is where we can go to um, uh, and members of the public, uh, inform them about the issues and get them to help guide us on what NICE's principles should be uh, and, and the extent to which um, and different circumstances in, under which we might consider, you know, trade-offs between environmental outcomes and other outcomes that, that uh, NICE is interested in. There's also discrete pieces of work. So NICE, NICE has um, uh, de developed a, a patient decision aid uh, for asthma inhalers, so um, helping um, patients to choose more environmentally friendly asthma inhalers. And we, we're, you know, there, there may be other piece, individual pieces of work like that that NICE gets involved in. Thank you, Kunal. Right, I think we've probably got time just, just to attempt one more question. Um, so this one um, is, around, is, is another implementation uptake issue in relation to committee members and the way in which committees work and what results methods are actually considered in decision making. Um, I'll probably try to tackle that one myself. Um, so, um, so 
I, I think that is a, an important issue. You know, obviously the actual frameworks themselves, the decision frameworks and the evaluation frameworks are, are sort of owned by NICE and reflected in methods manuals. But, but I do think there's a, you know, I, I do think there um, is, is, is sort of implementation issues around um, sort of, you, you know, in making sure that um, sort of committee members are sort of fully on board with, um, with, 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 with developments in, in, in methods, um, which I'm sure they, they, they are, but of course there is a challenge in making sure that there's the, the sort of awareness and training that goes alongside that. Um, I don't know if um, either Dahlia or Kunal want to add anything to that. Just to, to add that it links very well to, to the fact that we need the training for implementation as Alan flagged. So even committee members at a certain point when NICE recommends it's a, a new new approach or a new method, the, the, it's very important to get also committee members trained in how to use this and interpret this type of evidence so they are comfortable and confident uh, using it in decision making. And I see Alan. <laughs> Alan. It, well, I, I agree with the comment, actually. Um, I think it, I, I totally agree, and, and I mean, through the DSU, training to committee members is something we've done some of, but probably not enough. I think we need to do more in the future. But um, there is a bit of a, a challenge, I guess, for NICE in the process here, because some of the methods do become more and more complicated, not for the sake of, ac of academics just wanting to be, them to be more complicated, but they are the right answers to the challenges that keep coming up. And yet at the same time, I think committees, there's an issue about the makeup and the technical abilities of people on those committees, many of whom aren't selected because they're experts in, this, in the stats or the health economics. Um, and there's also, I think, more pressure, particularly technology appraisals, the time available to actually scrutinize the information and discuss it is, is decreasing all the time. So how you go about getting the right committee members to to use those methods you know it's it's not obvious what the answer is but it, I, I think there are yeah. competing pressures that's that is a difficulty yeah and, and i think the, the i think the challenge is is, is absolutely noted alan Okay, um, due to time, we're gonna to have to stop the Q&A at that point, but it'd be really helpful if we could just quickly do a poll question before um, before you all leave us. Um, and um, this is really around, um, you know, which of our methods research priority areas um, would you be interested in learning more about? Um, and I think you can vote for as many of these as you as you like, there's a multiple choice there. And um, we, we plan to use these results um, to inform sort of next steps. It could be more sort of events like this, or sort of other information that we um, that, 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 that we send out to stakeholders. So if you could vote, um, hopefully it's relatively straightforward to vote. And then um, hopefully we'll see some sort of live results as they as they um, become available. I understand that the poll is um, the poll is running, and um, we're just going to give it a few more seconds before we um, before we start showing the showing the results. Oh, there we go. Um, right. Well, that's really helpful. So there's there, there's a few areas where there is um, you know considerable interest. Um, and as I say, we will we will sort of use this um, to um, sort of in, in, inform our next steps in any any sort of future events. I'm very conscious that we're um, we're we're very nearly um, out of time, so I just wanted to um, thank our speakers today, um, Kunal, Dahlia, Carlos, and Alan. Your your inputs are very very much appreciated, and I also want to thank everybody for taking time out to um, to join this webinar today. It's um, your interest is is very very much appreciated. Um, I think we'll have to close at that. So thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye.